governor of the state of Alabama. Will the doorkeeper please admit the governor and her party? Thank you all so much. President Marsh, Speaker McCutcheon, members of the Alabama legislature, Chief Justice Stewart, Justices of the Alabama Supreme Court, distinguished guests, and my fellow Alabamians. Y'all oh, please be seated. What a game. to attend last night's game and witness a remarkable victory for the University of Alabama, oh, which brings another national title to the great state of Alabama. <laughs> I'm proud of Coach Sabin and the entire Alabama football team. Their, their victory is another example of excellence in, in our state striving for continued excellence. We are so very proud of them. As we begin this 2018 legislative session, we recognize that Alabama has experienced a significant transformation in state government since the first day of the 2017 session. On this occasion, I sat where my good friend, President Del Morris, sits tonight. 
and now due to a successful transition in state government I humbly stand before you as the 54th governor of Alabama I've been called on to report of the state of the state. When I became governor on April the 10th, our ship of state government was adrift. We needed thoughtful and straightforward leadership. Over the past nine months, we have proven that Alabamians seek progress, not stagnation. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, it is my pleasure to report that we have successfully steadied the ship of state and that the <laughs> I declare that the state of the state is strong and that our future is as bright as the sun over the gulf. Tonight, let's take a brief journey to consider where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. Most governors have three months to prepare. I had three hours. <laughs> Yet after being sworn in as governor on April the 10th, 2017, in the old Senate chamber just across the hall from where we gathered tonight, I promised the people of Alabama there would be no disruption in the ongoing functions of our state government. That's a promise kept. I promised the people that night that even though challenges lay ahead, we would seize opportunity and make Alabama greater and improve our government to be more effective. That's a promise kept too. And my immediate pledge that night was to steady the ship of state and navigate Alabama through the storm that we found ourselves in, seek a calmer path for our state, which we dearly love and are proud to call it home. That, too, is a promise kept. When I was sworn in, there were many decisions to be made. But I was focused, committed, and prepared. My first full day was the 16th legislative day in the 2017 session exactly halfway through the session, which I began as president of the Senate. As governor last session, working closely with the legislature, I signed 333 bills and resolutions into law. Together, we made significant progress with our budgets. We avoided proration and practiced fiscal responsibility. We renewed the Alabama Jobs Act, ensuring economic development continues and they provided the tools and the flexibility needed to attract new investments, creating more jobs for Alabama families. Many of the bills that I signed also bore my signature from my time as president of the Senate. The smooth transition of government brought me full circle, from legislative to executive, and I am better able to govern and to lead because of it. I support having a lieutenant governor who presides over the Senate. Our current order of succession serves the state well. I know this firsthand, having just experienced it. I strongly support our current order of succession. My first major effort in leading the state was to evaluate the cabinet and the staff of the new administration. With this evaluation, I made changes resulting in nearly half of the 22 cabinet members being replaced. My cabinet and staff are capable, honest people. They take their job to serve the people of Alabama seriously. They provide the people of Alabama with the open, honest, and transparent government that they deserve. My administration includes public servants who are subject matter experts and who work tirelessly to make Alabama a great place to live, to work, to raise a family, and to educate our children. And I'd like to recognize the cabinet tonight. Would all of you please stand 
These are outstanding public servants, and we want to recognize them. Thank you so much. My second effort was to connect with and hear directly from Alabamians so that together we would restore confidence in state government. You know, an effective leader does four things. Listen, learn, help, and lead. And to lead and help the people of Alabama, I knew it was essential that I first listen to and learn from the people of Alabama. Throughout July, August, and September, I embarked on my Listen, Learn, Help, and Lead tour. I visited communities all across the state. I spent an entire day meeting with local leaders in their communities, in their businesses, and in their schools. I wanted to learn about their successes, what was working, what was not working, what are their challenges. I wanted to hear from everyday people, not just those who are politicians and lobbyists in Montgomery. These meetings were beneficial and well attended, and I just believe our people were excited about getting reconnected with their governor. I wanted to restore our state's image, and to do this, government must be efficient and transparent. With executive orders, we've streamlined state government, dissolved unneeded task forces, and banned lobbyists from appointments by the executive branch thus ensuring more citizens have an opportunity to serve and to contribute. I also established the Opioid Overdose and Addiction Council to address the urgent opioid epidemic that is impacting Alabama families. Administratively, I've appointed more than 350 qualified and diverse individuals to boards and groups <coughs> which uh, affect the day-to-day -day lives of our Alabamians. One of the most important duties of government is providing protection and safety for our people. And I have worked closely with the Alabama Emergency Management Agency and local officials across this state through six weather-related states of emergency. Through coordinated efforts, we have improved our communication and response to natural disasters. The people of Alabama desire leadership that is willing to get things done. As a result of our team approach, I am proud to report Alabama's economy is performing well. Revenues are up, unemployment is way down, and economic development is on the rise, and improved educational opportunities abound. Since I became governor, over $3.5 billion in new direct investments have been committed to the state. These investments will bring forward 8,000 new jobs. The unemployment rate has fallen every month I have been in office. And our most recent unemployment numbers put the unemployment rate at 3.5%. Folks, that's the lowest rate ever recorded in the state system. <laughs> News of our economic successes seem to be a daily occurrence. In fact, I am proud to announce this evening that Kimber Farms will build a $38 million production facility in Troy, bringing with it some 366 new jobs. <laughs> Are, these are good, high-paying jobs and will enable more of our people to provide better for their families while taking part also in the rich history of the Second Amendment. We are proud and honored to welcome Kimber to Alabama tonight. This announcement and countless others just like it make one thing very clear. What we're doing is working 
And as a result, the people of Alabama are working and providing for their families. When I meet with global CEOs uh, from across the country and the, and the world of companies who have uh, firms here or who are considering locating their firm here, they tell me that their Alabama facility operates at a level that cannot be rivaled. My fellow Alabamians, that's because of you, your dedication, your commitment to hard work and to our skilled workforce. Companies choose Alabama because of your ability to work hard and be dependable. When a company invests in Alabama, they're not just investing in our state. They're investing in you, the people. And we should do everything we can to help every Alabamian find work. One of the most meaningful experiences that I have had since I was governor was to participate in the first ever Governor's Disability Job Fair, led by Secretary of Labor Fitzgerald Washington, Mental Health Commissioner Lynn Bashir, Dr. Graham Sisson, Executive Director of the Governor's Office on Disability, and Commissioner Jane Elizabeth Bertishaw of the Department of Rehabilitation Services. The fair consisted of more than 95 employers, and they were looking to fill 3,100 positions. Over 1,100 folks attended the Disability Job Fair. One of those job seekers is with us tonight. It is Corin McDade. Corin walked into the Governor's Disability Job Fair on October the 30th. She was looking <coughs> for an opportunity. As a teenager, Corin's learning disabilities plagued her until she saw no alternative but to drop out of school. She took GED classes at the Birmingham Career Center and was referred to the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services to work on resume writing, job development, interviewing, and placement. Rehabilitation Services paired her with staff from the Southern Hospitality Home Health Care of Fultondale. Within 48 hours, she had completed a second follow-up interview, and by the end of the week, she was employed full-time as a home health care aide. Corin, I just want to thank you for being with us here tonight. Thank you for being an example of the intrinsic value we all have and for being a reminder that what we as public officials do affects the lives of real Alabamians. Corin, please stand. Thank you so much, Karen. For Alabamians to have career opportunities, they must be prepared when the right job comes along. In my education initiative, Strong Start, Strong Finish, we will coordinate our efforts to do just that. We will bring all stakeholders to the table in order to improve education all the way from pre-K through to the workforce. I instituted Strong Start, Strong Finish because we must prepare our people for the jobs of today and for the jobs of tomorrow. By 2020, 62% of all the jobs to be available in Alabama will require a post-secondary certificate or degree. However, today, only 37% of our active workforce have such a credential. We must ensure that our students graduate high school and then earn a post-secondary certificate or degree. Effective education requires a strong foundation in a child's early childhood years. In 2017, under the leadership of Secretary Gina Ross, Alabama's first class pre-K program increased the number 
of classrooms to 938 statewide. Research shows us, friends, that those who participate in Alabama's first class pre-K program are more likely than other students to be proficient in reading at math, in reading and in math at every grade level. For the 11th year in a row, our first class pre-K program was recognized for being the highest quality pre-K in the nation. In fact, Harvard University is currently developing a full-length documentary on Alabama's pre-K program to share across the country with those interested in following our lead. Our first class pre-K is certainly a bright start, stop and bright spot in Alabama. We are proud of our first class pre-K program. I'm proud to have quickly become known as a governor focused on education. Over the past nine months, I have devoted a great deal of my time to my role as president of the Board of, State Board of Education. In less than two years, Alabama has had four different K-12 superintendents. That is not something to be proud of. The members of the State Board of Education must ensure continuity to see progress. Board members must set goals and adopt strategies to achieve student learning at high standards. Our central focus must be on our students, not on personal agendas or political maneuvering. <laughs> Tomorrow marks my first full nine months since I unexpectedly became governor, and a lot has happened then. We've lifted the dark cloud, wounds have started healing, and the people's faith in a government of the people and by the people is being restored. Though it is important to reflect on where we've been and where we are, it's most important that we put our, most of our focus on where we are going. Let me share with you a quote you've probably heard from time to time it's very relevant to where we are as a state. What lies ahead of us or what lies behind us is of little importance when compared to what lies within us. And in that spirit, I say to you, instead of dwelling on what adversity we have faced or what mountains we may soon climb, we must focus on being who we are, a resilient people a people dedicated to doing what is right and to making a difference in the world. Like always, our budgets are at the forefront of state government. However, this year, we find ourselves in an unfamiliar position related to our budgets. We are clearly in the midst of our recovery from the Great Recession, and unemployment is at an all-time low. Housing prices have increased for the third consecutive year, and Alabama is rated 12th nationwide for financial help. When I came into office, the relationship between the executive and legislative branches was strained. But that too has been corrected. I've worked closely with legislative leadership and the Senate and House budget chairs to draft fiscally responsible budgets. We've righted the ship of state. Now my proposed budgets will move Alabama in the right direction. Just as the Alabama families sit around their kitchen table to figure out their budgets to get them just right, we too must get the state's budgets just right. And I'm proposing strong, manageable budgets which responsibly fund state government without raising taxes on the people of Alabama. <laughs> I 
improved economy allows us not just to fund state programs, but to expand the ones that are making a positive difference. Now, it's tempting when times are not as tight as before to spend generously. But colleagues, we must resist that temptation. As a lifelong conservative, I believe in being physically responsible and in being good stewards of our taxpayer dollars. Not a single appropriated dollar belongs to government. Rather, it belongs to the hardworking men and women who have earned it. In that vein, my general fund restores fiscal responsibility by paying down Alabama's debt earlier than required. We will fund the government appropriately, but with prudence and care. As a positive sign of progress, there are fewer people eligible for Medicaid today than a year ago. That is good news. And good news on the jobs front means more people are working and less dependent on government services. Accordingly, Medicaid will require less general appropriations than expected. We are proving that conservative government creates economic growth. It lessens government overreach and it moves people towards self-sufficiency. Our strong economy with ample employment opportunities positions us not just to cover the basics as we have in the past years, but to ensure we fulfill our duty to the citizens of Alabama. We will pursue efficient government, which makes good use of our resources while appropriately funding state services. Government is called on to protect the people and to serve the people. My general fund budget does just that. We will put more state troopers on our roads. We will add more corrections officers all in an effort to serve and protect Alabama families. <laughs> Perhaps one of the state's biggest challenges is found in our prison system. For far too long, we have run our state's prison system in a way that risks a takeover by the federal courts. Now, in one federal court has found that our prisons are overcrowded and understaffed due at least in part to facilities that are worn and old. Correctional professionals work diligently to provide security, medical, mental health, and rehabilitative services in a challenging environment. They deserve our attention and support. And we must also work very diligently to provide appropriate care to those who are placed in the custody of the Department of Corrections. Immediately after taking office, I instructed Commissioner Jeff Dunn and his staff, working closely with my staff, <coughs> to develop a viable plan to address correctional staffing, which will improve the delivery of inmate health care and make capital investments in our infrastructure. We have commissioned comprehensive reviews to determine the compensation levels required to retain and recruit correction staff. We have entered contract negotiations with a new health care provider to expand and improve inmate health care at a reasonable cost. I have also instructed the commissioner to hire a project management team to help us develop a master plan so we will be able to make smart, cost-effective decisions when addressing our outdated prison infrastructure. We will no longer guess about possible fixes. Instead, I will present to the people a workable solution to this generational problem. I'm committed to meeting this challenge head on. Together, with the support of the legislature, we will solve this problem for generations to come. This is an Alabama problem we must have an Alabama solution. Now is the time to act. As many of you know, I'm from a small town in rural Alabama, 
Camden and Wilcox County. And rural communities like Camden have a very, very special place in my heart. I understand the challenges rural areas face, and it's my intention to do all I can to help make a difference in the lives of folks who live in rural areas. Supporting rural Alabama is central to my legislative agenda. Though we are almost two decades into the 21st century, many of our rural communities do not have adequate access to broadband. Adequate broadband enhances educational opportunities, increases economic development prospects, and develops critical communication systems. I strongly support legislation to encourage new broadband investments. And I ask the legislature to join me in assessing our state's broadband needs to ensure that the resources we're going to place are where they are most needed. I'm also for rural Alabama proposing the loan repayment programs for dentists and physicians assistants who agree to work in underserved areas of Alabama. Many of our Alabama citizens live in rural areas and we must provide their, uh, we must provide them the same access to quality health care as those who live in urban areas. Just as we address the needs of our rural citizens, we must also take care of those who've taken care of us, our veterans. My father served in World War II, and thus I understand the sacrifices our military men and women make. And I'm proud that one out of every 10 Alabamians has worn our nation's uniform. Sometimes when veterans finish their service, they struggle to find work. That's why I support ex extending tax credits to small businesses that hire veterans. And for those veterans who own their own business, they need our support as well. I am proposing legislation that will give preference to veteran-owned businesses that bid on our state contracts. Our veterans have given much to protect our state and our nation, and as a state, we must step up and repay them for their sacrifice. Tonight, I am proposing a pay raise for all teachers and all state employees. Every day we depend on state employees, whether it's a state trooper patrolling the highways or a teacher staying late to help a struggling student or a social worker rescuing an abused child. Quality state employees are essential to good government. It's long past time for us to honor their service with better pay. Like the general fund, my education budget is conservative, practical, and wisely uses state funds and state services while guaranteeing every Alabamian has an opportunity to a strong start and a strong finish to their educational journey. Education is the key to a quality life for all. And I'm focused on ensuring that our Alabama children get a good start and have the resources they need to complete school, to be prepared for the workplace and ultimately succeed. I'm very proud that the education budget I am submitting to the leg legislature tonight is the largest investment in education in a decade. In addition to raises for all teachers and support personnel, my proposed budget fully funds the K-12 request of $144 million and provides an additional $50 million for higher education. We will continue to have, we will continue to implement strong start, strong finish by increasing funding for our first class pre-K program by an additional $23 million. 
I'm also proposing funding for our Pre Through Three initiative, the Jobs for Alabama's Graduates program, and for education scholarships for math and science teachers. These additional dollars are investments in our children and in our young people, and thus are investments in our future. Education is especially effective when there is a concentration on particular subjects or skills. The Alabama School of Fine Arts in Birmingham and the Alabama School of Mathematics and Science in Mobile are special focus schools which effectively prepare their students for rewarding careers. As workforce needs evolve, we must create education opportunities that prepare our people to meet those needs. Tonight, I am announcing the formation of the Alabama School of Cyber Technology and Engineering, which will be based in Huntsville. This school will prepare some of the state's highest achieving students to enter the growing fields of cyber technology and engineering. Just as Huntsville has always been on the leading edge of the rocket and aerospace industries, the Alabama School of Cyber Technology and Engineering will ensure that Alabama students are at the forefront of today's emerging technologies. <laughs> With this budget, we will improve educational opportunities for all Alabamians. We are now in year two <coughs> of a three-year celebration culminating in Alabama's bicentennial in 2019. Our 200th anniversary as a state gives us an opportunity to reflect on who we are as a people. Our legislature has adopted an official state creed, which I'd like to share with you. I believe in Alabama, a state dedicated to a faith in God and the enlightenment of mankind, to a democracy that safeguards the liberties of each citizen and to the conservation of her youth, her ideals, and her soul. I believe it is my beauty, duty to obey her laws, to respect her flag, and to be alert to her needs, and generous in my efforts to foster her advancement within the place, placement and the advancement within the statehood of the world. As we ponder this past year and indeed the previous 200 years, and as we contemplate where we're going, we should embrace this creed. We should look at it as a guiding light for action in hopes that it may one day be a testament to the courageous leadership which brought this state from some of its toughest times into some of its greatest. Despite our differences, despite our varying viewpoints, despite party labels, I sincerely believe we all have one common goal, and that is to each play our part in making Alabama a better place to live, to raise and educate our children, to own a home, create jobs and business opportunities. As I look across this historic chamber tonight, and I see the faces of men and women who have made a commitment to public service. I propose a question to each of you. Why do we serve? Why have we chosen this path of public service? These questions are not new ones. In fact, they've been around for centuries. Johann Sebastian Bach is one of the world's greatest composers, and I expect most of you know that and likely agree. However, something you may not know about Mr. Mark is that he also had 20 children. Now, can you imagine? He was a busy man, just to say the least. <laughs> he was once asked, why do you write music, Mr. Mark? Now, he could have said, because I've got a large family and I need to support them, I need to provide for them. Or he could have said, well, just music comes naturally to me. 
But he didn't say anything like that. He simply replied that he wrote music for the glory of God and the good of mankind. Now consider his response. It was concise. It was honest. It revealed the character of his heart and the driving force behind his actions. He wasn't driven by himself, nor even the interest of his family. His, much, his motivation was much deeper, much more significant. So why do you serve? Why did you swear an oath of office to support this nation and our great country? Why are you willing to be a public servant? Now, you may have been motivated by certain issues or causes or philosophies or even individuals who encouraged you to seek office. And all those are good reasons to serve. But when our efforts, our actions, and our accomplishments are evaluated, when we leave a legacy like Bach, are we motivated by pride or power or greed? Or are we moved by the innate desire to make a difference in our state and in our world. I say we can make our state better if our purpose is the same, to serve for the glory of God and the good of mankind. Legislators, I simply challenge you to reflect on Bach's response as you enter the legislative chamber each day for the glory of God and the good of mankind. From the moment that our country declared its independence, we braced the truth that to be an American is to seek the impossible, to dare to dream despite opposition. Together, let us dream of a brighter Alabama, which in keeping with Bach's example, brings glory to God and brings about a greater good in the lives of our people. The ship of state has been steadied. Together, let's move it in a new direction toward progress and sustainability. I am honored to be at the helm of this magnificent ship we call Alabama, that benefits from a strong and committed crew, the good people of Alabama. May God continue to bless you and the great state of Alabama.